call upon our next keynote speaker, Professor Shala Masood from United States of America and her wonderful topic on breast pathology. Yes, Professor Shala Masood, can we have you? Are can you can there? You me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Right. Uh, do you have my slides? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, you we need to do. share the screen. Okay, we will do that. Yeah. Yes, we can see the presentation right now and we can also hear you. Right. You can go on. All right, thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. And what I'm going to do today is talk about borderline breast disease, an entity to minimize errors in overdiagnosis of low grade ductal carcinoma in situ in breast pathology. Um, so, the, the concept is and the plan is uh, to highlight the challenges associated with diagnosis of atypical proliferative lesions in breast pathology and to discuss the critical need for changing trend in diagnosis and management of these entities. So I would like to start with the question of why there is such an emphasis on atypical proliferative breast lesions these days. And the reason is very simple. Screening mammography and image detected biopsy have increased the diagnosis of atypical proliferative breast lesions and ductal carcinoma in situ. A majority of the lesions these days are being uh, detected by screening mammography, mammography or other breast imaging. And along the line of that, localizing devices have been practically used very frequently. And they end up to provide us with these small, little, tiny uh, fragments of core needle biopsy where we can make the morphologic diagnosis of cancer. And of course, there are sufficient amount of material that we can use to assess the status of breast biomarkers such as estrogen and progesterone receptors, peritone oncogene, as well as KI67. So the trend of the diagnosis has changed and the way that we are really diagnosing lesions have become diff different. Um, the facts that we need to remember is that the distinction between atypical ductal hyperplasia and low-grade DCIS has remained a diagnostic challenge. And this problem commonly leads to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And when that happens, naturally there are more expenses as well as there are more patient anxiety. And we will talk about them in length over examples of the cases. And there are, there's also evidence these days that suggesting that local ductal carcinoma in situ may not need cancer therapy. And that is an interesting concept, it's still controversial, but something to keep in mind. Now, um, let me begin with uh, the story of atypical ductal hyperplasia. Where have, come, where have we come from? We know that women who had who have a history of benign you know, breast disease experienced higher incidence of breast cancer. And fibrocystic change includes the spectrum of changes ranging from physiologic alterations all the way to features that approximate that of in situ lesions. And of course, previously, all of these entities were collectively called so-called fibrocystic disease. And this naturally, you know, resulted in, uh, resulted in a, a concept that started with a, a very highly cited um, study by Dr. DuPont and Page in 1985. What these investigators de did, they went ahead and look at retrospectively all the cases on surgical biopsy that has been called fibrocystic change. And then what they did, they classified them 
based on the morphological features seen in each entity. And they provided us with a new way of diagnosing benign breast disease. Meaning that the entire concept of fibrocystic change uh, practically consisted of non-proliferative breast disease, proliferative breast disease without atypia, and proliferative breast disease with atypia. And these are the entities that practically sort of compromise of the, uh, of the diagnosis that is being made as non-proliferative breast disease. Cyst, mild hyperplasia, simple fibroadenoma, papillary apocrine changes. Proliferative breast disease without atypia consisted of complex fibroadenoma, moderate fluid hyperplasia, fluid disclosing adenosis, and intradactyl papilloma. And proliferative breast disease with atypia were including atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, hydratoid extension to extralobular duct, radical scar with atypia, and multiple papilloma syndrome. Therefore, this classification brought the sort of different spectrum of changes and sort of changed the pattern of how we diagnose cases these days in breast pathology. The term fibrocystic disease was basically abandoned and the term of fibrocystic condition or fibrocystic change practically replaced the old terminology of fibrocystic disease. You know, along the line of that, what they did was Sorry, what they did, they, they look at this subtype of benign breast disease and they looked at the incidence of the occurrence of this entity with relative risk for subsequent development of breast cancer. And they also included family history as a part of the process of, sorry, as a part of the process of talking yeah, and, and considering these as, as a another risk factor. The incidence of this benign breast disease fundamentally was predominantly non-proliferative breast disease. And then there was really, there is still relative risk is very small, even in the presence of the family history. Proliferative breast disease without atypia are those um, incidence of slightly uh, less than non-proliferative breast disease, and they have a slightly increased risk, especially if it's associated with family history. The area that became more and more important to really discuss was proliferative disease with atypia. The incidence was small. The relative risk was large, especially if it was associated with family history of breast cancer. And naturally these incidences right now are very different because these incidences were based on surgical biopsies. Right now, naturally, predominantly, all of these components are done in corneal biopsy, and we are in their image detected biopsy concept. So we are seeing more and more of these proliferative breast disease with atypia versus low grade ductal carcinoma in sight. Therefore, this study showed that intraepithelial neoplasia fundamentally is considered as a morphologic risk factor. And then when you really look at the concept of the continuation of the features from non-proliferative breast disease to hyperplasia, ATP, and in situ lesion, as is demonstrated in here, basically what we are looking at, we are looking at the balance between proliferation and apoptosis. And therefore, in that scenario, relative risk is one is in non-proliferative lesions. However, when we look at ER and KR67, we can see that as the epithelial proliferation increases getting to the status of ER, you can see that the incidence of ER expression is slightly lower and the degree of proliferation is higher, which it is stated in here. And then there is that imbalance of the proliferation and apoptosis in areas when it gets to atypia and in situ lesion, and that leads to subsequent increase in the relative risk of subsequent breast disease. So that is the, the, the history of what uh, we have observed and where are we right now with um, proliferative breast disease 
particularly atypical diet or hyperplasia. Now, what I want to do, I want to spend a small amount of time to talk about morphologically, what are we talking about? Then we are talking about non-proliferative breast disease. Um, naturally, morphologically, you are de dealing with cyst formation, apocrine metaplasia, and some stromal sclerosis. By cytopathology, um, that we have really described the cytomorphology of uh, these lesions and have uh, developed the Massoud cytology index that distinguishes this concept very clearly for those that are interested. Non-proliferative breast disease by cytology practically manifests itself, itself as clusters of um, epithelial cells. Some of them, they have apocrine differentiation, as you can see it in here. And the other component, you can see these uh, very nicely um, uh, situated um, epithelial cells uh, with no ATP, and it is intermingled with uh, myoepithelial cells. Uh, these myoepithelial cells are slender, um, darker, and they are within the epithelial cells as well as in the periphery of these cells. And therefore, this is just an example of a non-proliferative breast disease. Proliferative breast disease without ATP shows a little different picture. What we have in here, you have, you know, breast biopsy, you have these ductal elements, you see proliferation of epithelial cells, sort of crossing the line. Uh, we have cyst formation, and of course, there's always some degree of stromal sclerosis. By cytopathology, you see that that honeycomb pattern that I just discussed and described and showed it to you is really has changed a little bit. There is a little bit of disarray in the way that the cells are reacting to each other. However, the most important thing is the presence of myoepithelial cell, as you can see it in here, with epithelial cells. You can see it more in here. Epithelial cells are larger, they're oval shaped, and they are lighter compared to myoepithelial cells that they are slender and darker and they're sort of in intermingled within epithelial cells as well as in the periphery of the ductal system. And therefore, with that concept, when we look at something like this in cytopathology, that is naturally is a reflection of a, a proliferative breast disease without atypia. Now, proliferative breast disease with atypia or ADH is sort of different story. You see the <clears throat> proliferation of epithelial cells, and you can see the almost monotonous appearance of these epithelial cells. However, in some areas, you can see the spindle cells. So this is a sort of a transition of atypical ductal hyperplasia, probably, or proliferative breast disease into possibly a low-grade DCIS. In cytopathology, you can see a very um, high level of proliferation. Uh, you see overriding of the nuclei. They are practically sort of living on the top of each other, on the shoulder of each other. And then uh, there is some degree of um, lack of anisonoclose, lack of um, polarity. There is some anisonoclosis here and there. And then you still can see these myopithelial cells. Now, what about low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ? Can we really diagnose this um, accurately? The low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ, when you really look at it, you see a distended duct. You, say, you see a monotonous appearance of these epithelial cells. You really don't see much of my epithelial cells around. And you can see this uh, very well-defined lacuni uh, that is a reflection of, in this case, cribriform pattern. When you look at cytomorphology, and if you can use your imagination, you practically see the same thing. These are the epithelial cells. Uh, they are monotonous in appearance. Uh, if you, you can see this cribriform pattern that you see in here. And these slides of, are really produced by a study that they did, and I uh, practically uh, compared the cytomorphology of non-palpable image-detected biopsies by fine needle aspiration biopsy, followed with um, needle localization excision or biopsy of the same site, so that we would be able to really compare the results very effectively. Uh, 
No. After all of these conversations that we have had, um, when we look at the literature and the study or the understanding that we have as of now, after all of these years, is um, the definition of atypical dicryo hyperplasia. And that is an entity which has some, but not all the features of low nuclear grade dicryo carcinoma inside. And you can see that this definition by itself opens the way for significant degree of inter-observer variability because everyone is going to be practically interpreting this concept differently. Now, what is in the literature in respect to the definition of low-grade dicryo carcinoma in situ? The two um, individuals that they have contributed to provide a, a, a sort of a guideline, a provide a, a system in which this can be diagnosed are Dr. Page and Anderson and Dr. Tavasoli and Norris. And Dr. Page indicates that in order to call something low-grade dactyl carcinoma in situ, you have two dactyl spaces completely faced in a single terminal dactyl lobular unit. They have to have monomorphic population. Uh, they have to have non-polarized epithelium, cribriform bridges without attenuation, and the uniform, uniform lacunar, lacunar spaces as you see it in here. <coughs> now, Dr. Tavasoli and Norris, they practically say the same thing in a different fashion. They bring the quantitation of less than or equivalent of two millimeter as the cutting point between calling something a typical dactyl hyperplasia versus local dactyl carcinoma in situ. Now, naturally these uh, criteria had been there. They had been based on surgical samples and not really low, you know, corneal biopsies that right now we are sort of working with. And this concept become polarized with the very unbelievably cited and controversial study of Dr. Rosai, who was one of the best surgical pathologists in our time. And then what he did, he sort of questioned and brought the concept of inter-observer variability between these two entities. He provided no standardized criteria, sent 10 cases to five so-called breast pathologists. And <clears throat> when the diagnosis was asked for, um, this is the result of that study. The number of pathologists in exact agreement and on percentage of the cases, you can see there is no agreement uh, between the groups. Uh, four or five agreed in 20% of the cases and three out of five agreed in 50% of the cases. So naturally that wasn't something very promising for anybody really consider as something to really remember. Then Dr. Schneider and his colleagues, they did it a little differently. They did the same study. They provided a standardized criteria of page. Uh, they increased the number of cases to 24. They increased the number of pathologists for five to six. And then they looked at the agreement. And in this agreement, even they show some progress. Uh, again, six of six people agreed in 58% of cases. Five of six agreed in 71, and four out of five agreed in 92% of the cases. And you can clearly understand that even with this agreement, you cannot possibly try to sell the fact that we know what we are doing. Even the fact that no one, no industry, no criteria in the world would accept 50% accuracy in what you do, in what you really report and expect people to follow your um, your sort of course of event in relation to the patient care. So this naturally has stayed and remained to be a problem. Now lately, um, there was another study with Dr. Elmore, and in this scenario, once again, all of these studies are associated with their own shortcomings, but anyhow, in this study, which was almost a few few years ago, um, she conducted a study to assess the degree of agreement among expert breast pathologists and general pathologists. Uh, she brought the set of 60 breast biopsies, 
refer about 240 total cases, one slide per case. And then he, she reported that the concordance rate of diagnostic interpretation of participating pathologies was 75.3%, with highest level of concordance seen for invasive cancer and lower level of concordance was seen for DCIS and atypia. And once again, this is not something that is very satisfying in respect to the choice of therapy and follow-up for the patients. We did a study to try to see that if morphologically we are not sure as what to call an atypical proliferative change in breast biopsy, could biomarker help us at any point? We selected 100 cases, 25 of each category, and then we subjected the <clears throat> biopsies to um, assessment of BCL2, ER, PR, DNA fluid, ER67, HER2 oncogene, and P53, and assessed the pattern of expression of these entities. And again, it was very interesting observation because we realized that the pattern of expression of high-grade breast lesions naturally were very different. These high-grade DCIS cases, they are ER and PR negative, HER2 oncogen positive, P53 positive, anucloid, and they have high proliferation rate. Whereas low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ, there were ER and PR positive, HER2 negative, KR67, low proliferation rate, and then they didn't have any P53 expression. And interestingly, the pattern of expression of atypical ductal hyperplasia versus low-grade DCIS they're practically identical. Intermediate grade, they had a sort of a mixed match of these entity. Therefore, it was very clear to us that, you know, biomarker studies as we have it, um, they don't really help us to try to make that distinction between a typical diagonal hyperplasia and low grade DCIS. So the issue that we raised at that point was, is it possible that a typical diagonal hyperplasia and low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ are in reality representing the spectrum of the same entity. And this is a question that has been on, on board for a while, and a lot of other investigators, they have looked at this. And because of that, a different kind of, you know, sort of interpretation or even um, terminology was proposed. And these are the suggest suggested terminologies. Intraepithelial memory neoplasia was suggested by Dr. Rosai in 1990s. Ductal intraepithelial neoplasia was suggested by Dr. Tavassoli. Low nuclear grade breast neoplasia family was suggested by European breast pathologists. And we have offered the term of borderline breast disease to try to recognize the difficulty between the distinction of a typical ductal hyperplasia and low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ, particularly in core needle biopsies, and try to offer the fact that these are the cases that you do total surgical excision of the lesion, and then better define the extent and the, the, the entire uh, characteristic of the breast lesion. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. So none of these entities right now are things that they are universally accepted and universally done and everybody sort of pretty much uses the terminology that they would prefer to do. Within our institution, border on blessed breast disease is a known entity, is recognized by our oncologists and surgeons, and they know exactly what do we mean when we put this one as our diagnosis. And when you really look at the literature and try to really understand where are we with this distinction, Again, quoting from Dr. Rosen, who is one of the most um, unbelievable authority in breast pathology, this is what he states in respect to the distinction between atypical ductal hyperplasia versus DCIS. This is his quote. There is no consensus presently on the criteria that should be adapted and how they should be applied for the distinction between atypical ductal hyperplasia and carcinoma in situ. He sort of follows and talks about that <clears throat> morphological criteria for the diagnosis of atypia, implying increased breast cancer risk and in situ carcinoma may be improved when it is possible to relate 
proliferative lesions to specific genetic or biochemical marker. And of course, we know that at this point, we are not close to finding that magic marker to try to really be able to really use that as an entity to make that distinction. Now, I want to just sort of bring a sort of a different concept to your attention. And that is the fact that uh, this distinction is not something that is relates to the intelligence or ability of the pathologist. I mean, naturally, we are highly trained, highly qualified people that we can follow the criteria and we can make the distinction. However, there are entities that, you know, remains as a diagnostic challenge. And the diagnostic challenge between these two entities has been recognized not only in fine needle aspiration biopsy, but in core needle biopsy as well as surgical biopsy. And the way that I look at this entity, this spectrum of changes that we see is just like a photography. For a good photography to really happen, you not only need to have a good <clears throat> photographer, a good camera, good light, you also need to have a good subject. And this is a subject that, that we don't really know enough to be able to really make that distinction with 100% accuracy. So let me provide you with the story of a patient. And this is story of a patient is something that is being seen in every, you know, best pathology practices. And this is not really unique to, to this story. This is just reflecting what we really, you know, see these days. And this was a self-referred, <clears throat> newly diagnosed breast cancer patient who was scheduled to undergo mastectomy and lymph node dissection. And you're talking about almost 10 years ago. The patient was 23 year old with no risk factors and discovered the mass when she was showering. The breast mass was sampled by core needle biopsy, was diagnosed as an invasive cancer. A palpable lymph node was found and was assumed to represent a lymph node metastasis. The patient was advised to have mastectomy and axillary dissection followed by chemotherapy. So when the patient called and wanted you know, to see me and <clears throat> look at this case for a second opinion very late in the afternoon where she had the biopsy the next day, um, naturally I asked for slides to be delivered to me in order to be able to look at them. And this is the core biopsy. And you can see these proliferative changes in here you can have two collection of, you know, proliferating cells in different areas. You can see very crowded, small gland formation in these areas. And this is what it was called as invasive, moderately differentiated ductal carcinoma and low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. And of course, when I looked at this, the concept that it came to my mind that this small gland formation and a stromal component is more reflection of the you know, adenosis concept. And you, you see a little bit of more uh, lobular structure of the breast uh, lesion that is still is preserved. So I had my dot in this case, and I asked for um, tissue blocks, uh, and I asked the patient to, uh, for time being, cancel the surgery for the next day until we are through with assessment of this core needle biopsy. Um, <clears throat> And this is the, the, the view of the corneal biopsy. You can see, again, it's very crowded, small gland formation in here. Um, you can see these glands very nicely in here. And when we did calponin, um, and you can do any kind of myopithelial cell marker, you can see the unbelievable expression of myopithelial cell marker in a variety of different components of this biopsy, meaning the epithelial cells. And that is a reflection of the fact that you're dealing with not in malignant cases. And myoepithelial cells are supporting cells of breast epithelial and ductal epithelial cells. And in a non neoplastic process, they do not participate in the process of that proliferation and, and um, increase, you know, um, presence of the epithelial cells. When malignancy occurs, the supporting cells will just practically do not participate and they will just leave the scene. That's the reason we do not see them in, in neoplastic process of the breast. Um, so fundamentally, uh, what we asked was the fact that uh, let's go ahead and totally surgically excise the entire mass 
and see what we are dealing with. And this is exactly what happened. And this is reflection of this entity. You can see naturally they are uh, proliferating. There are a lot of gland with various sizes that they are apparent in here. Uh, once again, uh, the myopedial cell marker defined that as a proliferative lesion. Uh, basically, that looked like an apocrine adenosis to us. And what we did at the same time, we um, went ahead and did finding the aspiration biopsy of the lymph node, which didn't show any evidence of metastatic disease. So when we discussed this with the pathologist uh, who was involved with this case, he, he practically said, well, why don't we just send it out for consultation with some other people that are not involved with the case? And I, I, I agreed with that. And I even said that I'm going to send it to two different breast pathologists, one in East, one is on the West Coast, and practically see what do they call this, with no history and no other information. We received two different diagnoses. One was a typical apocrine adenosis with sclerosis and associated fluorid sclerosing diagnosis. The other one is low-grade apocrine dactocarcinoma in situ with focal sclerosis, predactal and radial, involving multiple cores. So as you can see, naturally, we are sort of dealing with two different entities in here. So when we look at the whole experience and the patient's experience within a very short period of time, we have put the patient in the roller coaster of having been diagnosed with invasive cancer, predominantly metastatic breast cancer, to inside to lesion to atypia and leading to a benign you know, conclusion. And therefore, we needed to sit down with the patient and, and try to explain to her how this happens. And again, with that concept, I brought our radiation, radiation oncologists and surgeons and the patient and us, and we sat down and talked about that very freely, very openly. And in that scenario, she made a decision to just undergo surveillance. Let us examine you every you know, six months or a year, do imaging and see what happens. Uh, the patient didn't have any history of breast cancer in the family, therefore we were a little bit more comfortable with that. And then we tried to get her out of the media and not really make a big deal out of it. However, she was a part of the media, you know, and then she went and studied these cases. And then, you know, one day she came and said that it's, it's enough, it's enough, it's eight years and I have been doing all of this, everything that you have told is I am fine, I have married, I'm, I have two, two children. And I want to bring this story online. And she went and worked with people in New York Times. And actually, they went and found other breast cancer patients that actually have been diagnosed with DCIS when they have gone to another institution for you know, you know, reassessment. They have found out that they really do not have type of carcinoma in situ. And in that setting at that time, the, the patients with type of carcinoma in situ, they went to cancer therapy of excision or mastectomy or for that matter, sandalone node biopsy. This was the story sometimes in uh, a few years ago, and I was um, sort of interviewed with that. And in that scenario, naturally, my concern was the fact that we have a problem in respect to making this distinction accurately. And in many ways, it's just like flipping a coin as we are doing it. And naturally, that was a very politically right statement to make. But this is really the truth of the matter as we speak at this point that these diagnoses and the diagnosis of type of carcinoma inside is something that is casually made and this is something that we have to pay attention to. So the question that is uh, worth asking is uh, whose fault it is? Are we overdiagnosing breast cancer? Are we doing what we need to do? And one of the reasons that is difficult to really answer that question is because answering this question requires a, a long prospective study. Prospective study of the cases that they have this atypical proliferative breast disease. And we ask the patients that we do not excise it, we do not do anything with it, we just follow you for 10, 17, 20 years and see what happens to you. And patients really don't stand for that. The patients want, if there is a concern in their breast, they want that out. Therefore, having a prospective study to answer the natural history of progression of these breast cancer precursors to a full-blown invasive cancer is very difficult to do, and it hasn't been done. 
in variety of ways. Everything that we had is a retrospective assessment and a speculation rather than the true assessment of what we have. Now, along the line of that problem, actually, with genomics and genetic markers, these are the tools that we have, that there are a lot of people that are working on it, but they still, as I indicated, as of now, based on my knowledge, we really do not have that magic marker. Now, this is the story of the practice of breast pathology. Days after days, we have corneal biopsies, and we are confronting with lesions that naturally you see the evidence of proliferation in variety of different form, shape, magnitude, and then partial, you know, complete. And these are the cases that they, they go from one office to another one. We want to know what they are. Is it just columnar cell change with microcalcification? Is it just lobular neoplasia? I mean, what are these, you know, apocrine hyperplastic papillary overgrowth in here? So what do they mean? And then these are you know, more example of the same things. Uh, you can you can see the degree of proliferation and extension of the proliferative changes in variety of different form and shape. And yet you see this lobular pattern that sort of stays within the confine of the breast units, which may help to some degree to try to be careful not to call this cancer. Now, what do we have in respect to, do we have any tool to help us with that? The only thing that we have right now is high molecular weight cytokeratin 5 and 6 that distinguishes between florid ductal hyperplasia and versus ADH and low grade ductal carcinoma in situ. So it doesn't really help us in making that distinction, but it helps us to try to distinguish a variety of different florid ductal hyperplasia that naturally exist and provide some diagnostic difficulty. And then we have ecatherin that would give us the way to differentiate lobular lesions versus ductal lesions. So that is all we have right now in a routine practice of breast pathology. Now, this is just an example of cytokeratin 5 and 6. You have a lesion, you have proliferation. Again, look at the lobular pattern, cis formation, and then you have proliferation in here. Naturally, is it florid ductal hyperplasia or is it something more? And you can see such a nice mosaic pattern of cytokeratin 5 and 6 that will help us to be comfortable that we are not dealing with a morphologic risk factor, we are not dealing with ADH or low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. On the other hand, this is another case. You have this epithelial proliferation. Um, they have started to have this almost look like a cribriform pattern with some micropapillary lesion in here. And then you can look at the cytokeratin and you can see this area that it doesn't really have that mosaic pattern. So the decision of whether to call this low grade DCIS or a typical dagger hyperplasia, again, really sort of follows the rule of that two millimeter or you know, two rectal you know, units to be involved. And when in a core needle biopsy, we see just a small one microscopic focus of that, we try to really stay away from really calling it DCIS we call it borderline versus this and ask them to remove the entire lesion and let us take a look at all of the issues that is associated with that. Now, when we look at the current status of the practice of breast pathology and look at the diagnosis that were made in uh, corneal biopsies and look at the literature reporting increased rate of malignancy upon excision, you can see in all of these categories, ADH, DCIS, flat ATP, or lobular neoplasia, there is a sort of upgrade of the lesion either to higher in, in situ lesion or lower DCIS or the invasive cancer. So in this process, the, the concept of suggesting, and we make that in our pathology report to alert the, our surgeons and clinicians that this patient needs a follow-up surgical excision. So let me start to talk about why that distinction is clinically important. 
When we call something atypical like a hyperplasia, <clears throat> we are implying that we are dealing with a morphologic risk factor. It indicates increased risk to both breasts. It is not a precursor for invasive breast cancer and do not need cancer therapy. And that's a huge statement to make. When we talk about ductal carcinoma in situ, it may be a direct precursor to invasive cancer. The rate of invasive transformation is dependent on the grade. And risk of invasion is limited to ipsilateral breast and generally same quadrant at the same site. So the site matters in cases of ductal carcinoma in situ. High-grade lesions are often associated with unfavorable biological markers. Genetic alterations and loss of heterozygosity at various chromosome loci differ according to the CIS pattern and grade. Low-grade lesions are associated with the low nuclear grade breast neoplasia family. And this is a very important really consideration to make given the morphologic similarities and genomic abnormalities reported that they all fall in the same category. Now, ductal carcinoma in situ is a heterogeneous disease characterized by neoplastic proliferation of ductal epithelial cells with no evidence of a stromal invasion. And you can see the, and this is a low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. You have microcalcification. It's a high-grade ductal carcinoma in situ with necrosis and calcification. Now, the determinant of the biology of ductal carcinoma in situ depends on architectural pattern, nuclear grade, and presence or absence of necrosis. And this is a sort of a garden variety of features that we see in ductal carcinoma in situ. Low-grade lesion, cribriform type, micropapillary type in here. This is another low-grade lesion. We can see the monomorphous appearance and the uniqueness of this cribriform pattern, very regular. You can see ductal carcinoma in situ with necrosis, or this also can be a lobular carcinoma in situ with central necrosis that we have to do with catering to make that distinction. You have micropapillary, you know, DCIS, and so on and so forth. Why is it important to even make this pattern as a part of the process of reporting that micropapillary DCIS has been recognized or micropapillary carcinoma of the breast, they are they have lost their adhesion molecule, and they are associated with bilaterality, multifocality, and, and there are lesions that if it is diagnosed, especially if it's multifocal, maybe consideration should be given to a mastectomy so that we can reduce the chance of recurrence and coming back with patients that ultimately undergo mastectomy. So these determinants are important for us, and these are the ones that naturally we need to report in our breast pathology report. Now, let me look at ductal carcinoma in situ and what are the treatment Papa, options. This home, local white excision with and without radiation therapy and mastectomy, these are the treatment option that has been associated with what we are calling is a ductal carcinoma. Therefore, atypical ductal hyperplasia versus low-grade ductal carcinoma and that distinction is very important. There are truly two different entities that we need to really make sure that they are being diagnosed accurately. Now, I wanna uh, bring you to a very important um, study that it was reported a few years ago by Dr. Narod. And this individual designed a study to estimate 10 to 20 years mortality rate from breast cancer following the diagnosis of DCIS and standard cancer therapy. This observation of the study used information registered in the SEER database from over 100,000 women. So it was a very well studied concept. What he reported was that the risk of dying from breast cancer in these patients was about 3.3%. And this is something that is pretty much very similar to what the general population of and mortality, so it wasn't really significant. At 20 years, this risk was higher for the following patients. Younger patient, before age 40, black ethnicity, high grade ductal carcinoma in situ, larger size, more than five centimeter, your negative status, heritonal oncogen positive status, 
And these are the patients that they are high risk, like the person we decide to, that they require naturally cancer therapy. So the issue in the question after this study was, do the patients with low grade DCIS need to undergo cancer therapy? And do we need to abandon the use of the term carcinoma for lesions that may not be biologically malignant? This study or this question still is on, on, on the board and whoever would find a reasonable response to that are, are, are going to be very welcome to really participate in the process of expressing their opinion. Dr. Esserman is one of those individuals that, you know, sort of shares the same concept with us uh, and, and that is what she says. Current data suggests that low-grade DCIs should be considered a risk factor for invasive breast cancer and an opportunity for targeted prevention, meaning hormone therapy. Radiation therapy should not be routinely offered after lumpectomy for DCIs lesions that are not high risk because it does not affect mortality. She goes on and suggests that we should continue to better understand the biological characteristics of the high risk DCIS, large high grade hormone receptor negative, herptonone positive, especially in very young and African American women, and test targeted approaches to reduce death from breast cancer. So, this is the way that right now is the status of the distinction between. DCIS and atypical ductal hyperplasia. I'm going to spend just a few minutes to talk about this issue associated with the current challenges associated with the practice of breast pathology are the issues that we need to pay attention to. Currently, diversity, the, the, the issues that we have is the diversity in tissue handling, processing, and reporting is significant. We have insufficient evidence-based correlation between morphology and the patient outcome significant inter-observer variability in diagnosis and test results, and communication barriers among physicians involved in breast care. A lot of patients that they have their biopsies in imaging centers and they send it to a variety of the commercial laboratories, the communication between pathologists and radiologists is practically lost. There are no uniform guidelines to measure the rate of our diagnostic errors. Error or fear of disclosure and medical legal issues limit the report of diagnostic errors. There are many localized in breast pathology that can mimic cancer. Breast pathology is considered as a component of surgical, general surgical pathology, and breast pathology fellowships are not accredited by ACGME. Believe me, I have tried very hard. If you recall, I have established the International Society of Breast Pathology, and actually the first breast pathology in the world simply because I think breast pathology is a very unique experience for the pathologists to become involved in, in really planning of the therapy for patients. And that's a very good way of trying to participate uh, be, as a clinical partner in care. And of course, as I mentioned, referral pathology samples to commercial laboratories impairs communication. To acknowledge the challenges associated with the current practice of pathology is very important and that is our suggestion. And we need to design studies that can appropriately ana analyze the problems and quantitate the impact on the therapy, patient outcome, and health economy. We suggest that we need to continue to look at the establishment of quality <clears throat> assurance measures, whether they are internal quality measures, uh, by consensus slot conferences, mandatory second review of cancer cases, mandatory adherence to established criteria, or the use of second opinion. The review of outside pathology slides and reports by a local pathologist before the initiation of cancer therapy is really something that we routinely do in our institution. And of course, we have to get into the involvement in external quality assurance measures if they are present. Just give you an example of some of the very small reports in the literature that they talk about the, the rate of discrepancy when the cases have gone for second opinion opinion. You can see the rate of significant disc discrepancies ranges between 10 to 20 percent. So we're really looking at the issue that we need to recognize the significance of it. Um, this is another study that Dr. Newman reported in cancer that they looked at review of both imaging as well as pathology 
in their TUMA conferences and based on, based on those interpretive changes, you can see the change in the surgical management, 16% by imaging and 9% by pathology. So second opinion is a very important concept in breast pathology. So what do we suggest? We suggest to abandon the term of low-grade tactical carcinoma in situ totally, use the term of borderline breast disease, completely remove the entire lesion, and offer risk assessment and risk reduction options to the patients. Offer the option of wait and watch for borderline lesions for low-grade DCI is similar to what is being done to low-grade prostate cancer. The impact of what we are talking about is reduce anxiety to the patient and family, minimizing unnecessary expenses, and restoring the patient trust that we know what we are doing. And again, this is not an easy process, uh, but I want to remind you of Dr. Haggison um, many years ago, who ultimately uh, was able to um, convince the colleagues that let's put low, low put lobular, put a typical lobular hyperplasia and lobular carcinoma in situ together and use the term of lobular noplasia and define the varieties such as pleomoric lobular carcinoma that are a little different and try to make sure that they indicate and they review and then consider lobular neoplasia as a morphologic risk factors, not a cancer that re requires therapy. If you recall, recall a lot of women in the past, they, under, they have undergone bilateral mastectomy because of the diagnosis of foci of lobular carcinoma in situ. We practically need to start looking at lower tactile carcinoma in situ as an entity that we can do better than call it cancer and produce anxiety and really discomfort and really compromise patient care. And we need to better define the morphologic and biologic characteristic of a spectrum of high-risk proliferative and precursor breast lesions and change the concept, terminology, and the pattern of practice. And of course, that you know brings me to the last slide of mine, and that is the recognition of the fact that over 1.1 million women are diagnosed with breast cancer each year across the globe. Even if you look at the lowest estimated diagnostic error in breast pathology to be 2%, it appears that a significant number of women will receive and there are over treatment. And we need to really bring some measures and sensitivity and appreciation and acknowledgement that we do not have that magic marker yet. And we better be, we better be careful anytime that we are gonna you know, designate and give a patient a diagnosis of cancer because it has significant financial, psychological, and family issues that is associated with this cancer. As you know, there are countries in the world that if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, I mean, that means that the husband can leave that woman. Um, the girls from that family are not gonna be really um, uh, looked at as a good uh, partner in their life and they lose their opportunity of marrying the other people. So there are a lot of issues associated with that that I don't have to, time to go into that, but please be careful any time that you want to make the diagnosis of low-grade tiger carcinoma uh, in a patient and try to look at other alternatives that you can be sure of what is it that you are labeling a patient with. And of course, this concept, this change in terminology, terminology is not really going to happen with one person. This really requires an integrated multidisciplinary uh, team efforts among the people that are interested in in well-being of patients with breast cancer. And they're interested in the women health collectively to try to be careful as how do we diagnose, how do we communicate, and how we educate our physicians and also our patients in respect to the lesions that they carry and make sure that nobody really get into the status of uh, anxiety and make an impulsive decision about going ahead and divorcing their breasts by bilateral mastectomies that is becoming a, 
a very increasing incidence uh, all over the world. And with that, um, I thank you for the opportunity and I hope that I had delivered the message that would be of use for you in your practice. And have a great night or day wherever you are uh, living at the moment. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Shala Masood. That was a wonderful speech. And this study once again highlights the commitment and dedication to breast pathology from your end. And it has also shown and highlighted various other aspects like retrospective assessment of breast pathology can make a difference to our diagnosis and how it helps in choosing the treatment modalities as well and how the current challenges associated with practice of breast pathology and the issues were mentioned in your presentation. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Dr. Shala Masood. Any, anyone who has questions for Dr. Shala Masood, the platform is, for, is open for the questions. Anybody who wants to ask Questions? Yes, the platform is open. And uh, Dr. Alvaro uh, has thanked uh, Dr. Masood for a clear conference. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day and a great night, all of you. Take, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So I can I expect any questions from anyone? Uh, is anybody having any questions? Uh, okay. Only a small yes. comment, please. Um, I really appreciate a lot the conference of Dr. Masood uh, because uh, emphasize the multidisciplinary uh, study needed in face uh, the breast pathology. Uh, the confidence in a multidisciplinary team uh, with the specialists in radiologists, the good clinicians and pathologists, uh, it's uh, very uh, important in, in this uh, area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.